Today we're going to look at the topic of uh, the sin unto death. Now the sin unto death, as it's commonly taught, is this. That a Christian can wander away from the fold, away from the fellowship of God, um, and God will get angry and boom, take that child out and take him home early where he's going to deal with him at the judgment right then and there and give him a whooping. That's basically what's presented when we're talking about this sin unto death. And um, that type of presentation, although not verbatim, is what is presented, for example, by uh, Dr. Ralph Yankee Arnold. But he's not the only one. There's a lot of others. And I'm not saying that, that people that teach this are lost. Uh, at one time, I did teach a version of it, although it wasn't that strong. And that's because I just repeated what I had been taught in church. And I come to realize that um, obviously I need to study the scripture for myself and to compare scripture with scripture. Let the scripture speak to you with the witness of the Holy Spirit. Um, none of us have all the answers, but as I was um, going over 1 Corinthians chapter 3 the other day in the video about rewards and uh, the judgment seat of Christ, this whole idea of the sin unto death is tied into rewards because, let's face it, if the sin unto death is true, you're going to get to heaven by the skin of your teeth, um, no rewards for you, and then we get into a whole bunch of other things. And the Bible says to avoid foolish questions. Um, you know, and a foolish question is one that really has no answer and it causes a whole bunch of other questions. So, this idea is carried further that there's some type of pecking order, that there's uh, some type of, of um, greatest to the least, uh, when the Bible clearly tells us that uh, of men born among women, John the Baptist, there was no greater, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So all of us are one in Christ. Every single person at the rapture will have a glorified eternal body. Now there are parables which I'm not going to deal with today. I'm going to deal with it in a separate one. But Jesus spoke of parables of when he came at the at, when he comes at the second coming, when people are still in their uh, just physical bodies. They haven't got their new bodies yet, and they live into the millennium. Um, these people will be given uh, positions in the kingdom based upon their service to him, and even then. Um, you see phrases like, according to their several ability. You see, God gives each one um, a task to do based upon how he has equipped them. Uh, the Holy Spirit hasn't equipped everyone, the single, every single person the same way. Some are teachers. Uh, some are um, just uh, evangelists. Uh, there's all these different positions in the church. And... Uh, God equips each person for the task because that is how the body is uh, jointly fit together. That's how the body functions. Um, and God knows all these things. He knows who needs to be where, doing what. And uh, even in the millennium, it would look like it's on the surface when you look at these parables that there's some type of pecking order, but there isn't. God puts in a position each and every person according to their ability. Just like when he handed out the talents, he gave five talents to one and two talents to another and one talent uh, to the other one. So it, it's, it's because God looks upon their heart and he knows their ability and he knows how he has equipped them to do the task. Um, so we're going to look today at the sin unto death. And as I said, I, I did uh, believe a version of this, a, a variance of this, that, that you know, a, a person that sins and continues to sin can be taken off the earth early. Um, so I'm going to be looking at what the Bible says about this today and just give you some scripture to ponder. And I may go ahead and make this two parts. But first of all, we're going to go to uh, 1 John the fifth chapter, that's where we find this phrase, the sin unto death. And it's really important to understand um, how uh, there's a contrast here, okay? And 
uh, we tend to read over things really fast and then try to fit it together in our head in a hurry instead of just pondering each sentence and then thinking of scripture that sounds similar to that so we can uh, learn and grow and get get uh, more wisdom uh, based upon scripture compared to scripture uh, as the Bible says line upon line precept upon precept here a little there a little so it's important not just to pull uh, one single scripture out and then make a doctrine out of it uh, that is how the Mormons come up with baptism for the dead uh, wherefore are they uh, baptized for the dead you know they they take this one little scripture and they turn it into oh well, we got to get baptized for dead people so they can get into heaven um, no that's a false teaching people go to heaven because they believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God and they've trusted in him for their salvation uh, not because uh, they've been dead and now somebody gets baptized for them so they can go on up into heaven um, that is unscriptural but we're gonna look here um, Let's start in verse 15 of 1 John chapter 5. And it's important to understand the context of, of what is being taught here. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, and who's the we? That's the saved. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And obviously this is understood within the context of we petition the Lord, we desire of Him, we ask of Him uh, based upon Holy Scripture, based upon the known will of God, what we see in Scripture. Uh, do we have a reasonable expectation of, Lord, let me win the lottery this week? No. Um, that's not what it's talking about. Um, it is prayer for one another, uh, to lift one another up in prayer, uh, prayer for our daily needs, uh, prayer that just glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ and exalts and uplifts Him. Um, verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Now, this sentence here is talking about a brother praying for another fellow brother. Okay? Um, look at, for an Old Testament example, look at Job, Job 42, verse 8. And we'll see an example of a saint that did that. And we'll also see the result. So, Job 42 and verse 8. says now God is speaking here and he says therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you for him will I accept lest I deal with you after your folly and that ye have not spoken of me the right or the thing which is right like my servant Job so um, Job of course prayed he did these sacrifices on behalf of of these three friends that had um, not judged rightly with uh, Job and had been uh, very harsh and unfair pretending to speak for God when they indeed did not and so Job prayed and and the, the fellowship there was restored um, and of course there is no record that God did anything to them um, that's because I believe that these people, uh, while they might have spoken foolishly, um, I, I really believe that that they uh, that they really believed in God and that they had really trusted Him. Uh, however, they all got together and uh, had this big conversation with Job, and it didn't go too well for them. Um, so that is an Old Testament example. We don't see where these people were all struck dead uh, for their foolishness. And, and like I said, whenever um, 
the Bible says to avoid foolish questions because what foolish questions do is they beget more foolish questions and there is no end to them and there is no answer to them. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that if everyone um, didn't walk perfectly in the Spirit every single moment of every single day, uh, they could all fall under this, uh, this sin unto death. I mean, you have a bad day where you mess up and, and things happen and, and um, all of that. Why, it's easy to point a finger at somebody else and say, oh, better watch it, there's the sin unto death. And this whole idea about the sin unto death has even taken to extreme uh, positions to where it's just utterly prideful. It's absolutely despicable, the pride that's involved in this sin unto death because it involves a lot of finger pointing among Christians, among believers with other believers. And uh, there's even one example that's taught where... Um, people who commit the sin unto death and they lose all the rewards, they're standing outside the gates of heaven, they're not even allowed to go in, and they're looking inside at, at the victorious brethren who did it all correctly, and they're partaking of the tree of life and everybody else is deprived of it because they lost the reward, therefore they don't deserve it. So we're also going to be looking at that word reward, and also the law first mentioned in scripture. So. Here we see, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Because we're uplifting that brother in prayer. You know, when your brother has fallen down, you don't kick him down further. Okay? Now that's not to say that you have to tiptoe around and not expose false teaching of people that do that. That's an entirely different story. But I'm talking about um, a brother that's caught in a trespass and and you don't go up to him and say, how stupid was that? Now, now you foolish man, you're going to lose your reward and get the son unto death and God's going to take you home and beat you right there on the throne in front of all the angels. Um, no. That's not even in scripture. So another scripture I want to look at real quick is Matthew 12. Matthew 12. And verse 31. And this really ties in um, with the sin unto death that John is speaking of. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that um, here in just a bit. But look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So, this whole idea of the sin unto death is tied in with um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, how does one blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, a believer cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. That is what an unbeliever does. Why is that? It's because um, when you bear witness of the truth with someone and you give them the gospel, and you say, look, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood to pay for all of your sin. Um, he's already forgiven the world. He wants uh, to reconcile you to himself so that all you have to do is believe on his name. Now, if you fail to do that um, and you reject Jesus Christ, you're already under condemnation. There's nothing else you have to do. But if you want to avoid this condemnation, this eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, you need to believe on him and put your trust in him because he loves you. And he cares for you like no one else in this entire universe. So, what happens when, when you share the gospel and they reject it? They blaspheme the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost bears witness of the truth. And he convicts the world of sin. So, when they have rejected the word of God, when they have rejected the gospel, 
they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost because they are in essence calling him a liar. They are saying the Holy Spirit is a liar because um, they don't believe the word uh, of God that was told to them. And they have not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. They have rejected uh, the gospel. And in doing so, they blaspheme the Holy Ghost by calling him a liar and saying, no, his witness is not true because the Holy Spirit bears witness of the truth and Jesus Christ is the truth. And so when someone rejects the gospel, they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Um, so it is not, of course, something that, that a Christian can do because uh, we have believed the gospel. We've put our trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, we are reconciled to the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Jesus Christ now covers us and um, he has washed us in his blood. He's given us robes of righteousness. We are new creatures in Christ. So that is not for us, okay, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And um, so continuing on in verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Okay, so now we have a new sentence here, a new thought that's being introduced. And there is a sin unto death. Now, think about this, if you would, brothers and sisters. Okay, there is no way to reconcile these two thoughts together clearly, concisely in Scripture. That on the one hand... Um, all your sin has been forgiven, past, present, future. And on the other, somehow God is going to hold a sin against you and boom, take you out and kill you and send you home early. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, some days I don't feel very well. And to me, uh, to be taken off this earth a little sooner rather than later is not really any great punishment to me at all. In fact, it would just be a joy because this life is over and I'm in the presence of Jesus. Um, if anything, it would be uh, a way to punish others, you know, my family or something, but certainly not me, not myself. Now, um, I want to read something in regards to that. Turn with me over to Colossians 2, because this is our position in Christ. Colossians 2. And look at... Um, starting in verse 10. And ye are complete in him. Notice ye are complete. Notice the tense. Uh, you're not going to be complete someday. You are complete now. That's how God views you. He already views you as holy. He already views you as sanctified. Um, we are waiting on that glorified eternal body at the rapture. For some it will be the resurrection. Um, but he says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, and that is the baptism of the Spirit, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So, we have the sure victory, friends. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, therefore we're going to be risen from the dead. We're going to get a new body. It's guaranteed. We already have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We have the earnest of the Holy Spirit. His down payment has already been provided. He will redeem his purchased possession. Um, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. So, look at the next verse. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, when you're reconciled to God, okay, and this is the core teaching of true salvation, is once saved, always saved. Um, when you're reconciled to God, all your past, present, future sin has all been forgiven. It's all been blotted out, okay, Otherwise, if there was one single sin standing between you and God, you would not be acceptable. Uh, you would not be able to go to heaven. If, if God says, I'm going to blot out everything except for this one sin unto death, uh, 
it's so commonly taught, then God is a liar. And God forbid that we should say such a, such a terrible, horrible thing. Um, because Jesus Christ is the truth and him is no guile. Um, when he opens his mouth to speak, it is the truth and is wondrous. Having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You see the Old Testament law that we couldn't keep, that people would run around try to fulfill. Oh, I've got to keep the Sabbath because it'll make me holier. Um, I've got to avoid eating pork because it's unclean. Um, all these various ordinances um, were nailed to the cross with Jesus. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So there is no question that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He paid for the sins of the whole world. When you believe on him for salvation, you are reconciled once and for all. So if there was this sin unto death standing between you and God, God's not going to kill you and take you off the earth early to go deal with you later. That would be an impossibility because all of the sin has been dealt with at the cross. You are once and for all reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ by his shed blood on the cross. You have been given the righteousness of Christ. When God looks upon you, the saint, he sees his son. There is not one instance in scripture of anyone appearing before God when they died and getting a whipping. Not one. Um, there is no record of David after uh, murder and adultery. He lived many more years after that and died in old age. So um, the question is, though, why do people sometimes die earlier than it seems that they should? Well, that's a different thing. It's called the law of sowing and reaping, which I'm going to get into in just a minute. Um, but let's get back to 1 John chapter 5. And we see, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So there is a contrast. All throughout Scripture you're going to see a contrast. The righteous, the wicked. Who, who is God speaking to? Who is he speaking about? There is a sin unto death. Now, why do people go to hell? There's only one reason. They've rejected Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Notice what it says over in um, over in John chapter three, the gospel according to John. And let's look at that briefly. And it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, the unbeliever is in a state currently of condemnation. Were they to die right then and there, they would go to hell. Um, the unbeliever in his state has rejected Jesus Christ. They must believe the gospel to be saved. And that is why it's so important that, that uh, people, that, that Christians make sure of what the gospel is, make sure it's taught correctly, because there's so much false teaching creeping into the church, just like I've been dealing with this false inclusionism gospel. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So you see, Sometimes, well, quite a bit, you, you can share the gospel with somebody. They don't want to hear it. They love their evil life. That's what they want to do. Um, they, they don't want to believe the gospel and be saved and go to heaven. Okay? Now, this is interesting. It says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So the sin unto death would be unbelief. Because people die and I believe they go to hell. They've rejected Jesus Christ as the Savior. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, brothers and sisters, has there ever been anybody that you're just really aggravated with, mad and angry? Um, perhaps it's some 
world leader or whoever, and you say, man, I just wish they'd die and go straight to hell, because they deserve it. Well, we're not to pray that. This really ties in with another scripture that says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Um, we are not to pray that God just strikes them dead and sends them straight to hell. Uh, Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to them that spitefully use you. So, to pray for a sin unto death for them, I mean, that God just strikes them dead and takes them off the earth, we're not to pray for that. We are, oftentimes in our flesh, uh, we end up in that type of thinking. Well, you know, that person has just hurt me so bad. They've just done so much to me that I just wish they'd die and just get off the earth. Um, that's not what we're to pray. Let's continue. Verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. You see, God, when he saves us, he recognizes us as holy. The righteousness of Christ has been given to us. See, Jesus not only paid for our sin, which brought us up out of the hole and zeroed out the balance, he then gives us an infinite amount of his righteousness into our bank account. So, uh, the, the saint is recognized of God as holy and as perfect because uh, Jesus said, be perfect even as I am perfect. So that righteousness of his is transferred to us and that is how God views us. I know we have trouble viewing ourselves as that um, because we still have this, uh, this war going on, the flesh against the spirit, the spirit lusting against the flesh, each one contrary to the other. Um, and we have this uh, um, battle in our mind where we, we are renewing the mind, um, where the mind can be fleshly and puffed up, or it can be spiritual. Um, it can be carnal, or it can be spiritual. And so we are dealing with this day after day, and will until Jesus calls us home. But God already knew all this in his foreknowledge. He knew uh, all of these things. But he does not want us to uh, be constantly worried that every little thing that's going to happen, God is going to strike us dead and take us off the earth. Um, there would have been plenty of opportunity for him to do that uh, with uh, his disciples. Um, because sometimes they didn't even believe his miracles. So he could have just got fed up with them right there and said, that's it, I'm done. But our God is a loving God. He loves his children. He is patient and kind. He is a loving father. He is perfect. Uh, even us fathers on our best days are, are not going to match the infinite love um, while we're on this earth of, of Jesus Christ and, and what he has done and how he loves his children. Okay. Now, I also want to look at... Um, Let's see. Let's look in uh, Galatians chapter 6 next. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at the law of sowing and reaping. And you need to understand that the law of sowing and reaping is separate and apart from God just getting fed up and striking you dead and taking you home. He's going to give you a whipping right then and there. Um, Galatians chapter 6. Romans, Galatians. Okay. Verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now we have a choice, brothers and sisters. We can walk in the spirit or we can walk in the flesh. Um, we can do things to make ourselves happy or we can serve the living God. We can serve the risen Savior who died for us, who gave his life for us, who now owns us. We are his purchased possession. Or 
in our will, we can uh, decide to disobey Him and do our own thing. Now, if we disobey Him and do our own thing, uh, a lot of times it's going to lead to disaster for us. Uh, those kinds of things in the physical life can cut our life short. If we decide we want to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, then you know we shouldn't look at things and say, well, how did I get lung cancer? Uh, or if I decide that I'm going to break the law by um, getting totally drunk and driving down the highway and um, I take out three lives and go to prison, um, did God do that to me? No, I did it to myself. Uh, there are things that we do ourselves because we don't follow the wisdom that's in the scripture. Um, does that mean God's angry at us and he's going to take us off the earth early? No. Um, God will not necessarily shield us from all the consequences of the actions that we take on this earth. Um, and he will help us to learn and grow through it. He will use what happened and to help us grow um, on this earth uh, through chastening. And chastening isn't Jesus reaching down out of heaven and giving you a whooping. Chastening is God taking circumstances in your life um, that help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, perhaps it'd be a lesson learned um, in these various circumstances. So people tend to get this confused, and I did too at one time. But it's a totally separate issue, okay? It's not the issue of God says, that's it, I'm done, boom. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times people bring trouble upon themselves. And when we do things on this earth that um, is contrary to Scripture and disobedient, um, we will tend to bring things upon ourselves that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I want to speak just a moment about rewards okay before I wrap this up now I have said before that Jesus Christ is our reward we are complete in him we are one in Christ um, we are seated spiritually in heavenly places with Christ Jesus at the right hand of God we are in Christ okay so people get this idea that um, okay well they committed the sin unto death so they get no rewards or this person gets less rewards, um, this person gets more rewards. Uh, what does the Bible say? The first time that the re word reward appears in Scripture is actually in Genesis. And I've said many times that Jesus is our reward. And that is indeed very scriptural because that's what God says. Look what he says in chapter 15 of Genesis in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So, Jesus is our reward. Abraham, the father of the faithful, is the example set forth early in Scripture about this. And the Bible makes it clear that, that the Gentiles have been grafted in. Um, that we are uh, part of, of Israel and the spiritual Israel. And God himself to Abraham um, sets himself forth as the reward. And friends, I don't know about you, but to have a glorified eternal body, to always be with Christ, never to be apart from him, um, to always be there with him, to listen to him, to see him, to behold him in his glory, and to have have this eternal life for all of eternity. Um, what else could there be? I mean, the reward, money, you know? What else would the reward be? What else could you have? Um, oh, well, I'm going to have this bigger mansion, or I'm going to have more furniture than you. That is very carnal thinking. That is earthly thinking. That is not heavenly thinking. We must be heavenly minded. We must put off this earthly thinking and think heavenly minded. And um, it is high time that we, we uh, wake up to what the Bible really says. And, uh, you know, that's like these word of faith teachers that teach, you know, 
if you don't pay your tithe, you're not going to have any furniture in your uh, bedroom there in heaven. You're going to have to sleep on the floor. Wow, really? Um, like I'm going to need sleep in the first place? I have a glorified eternal body. And uh, what else would the reward be? Money? Uh, the streets are paved with gold. You know, what am I going to do carrying around a bag of gold? Besides, my God has promised that everything's already free. Look, turn with me over to um, Isaiah. Isaiah 55, and the same promise is reiterated in, in uh, Revelation 22. Look what he says in Isaiah 55 here. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy. See, you can buy it without money. That's because it's free. Come ye buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's already paid for. There's a big, huge banquet feast in heaven, and it's just waiting, okay? And it's free. Uh, there's no need for, oh, well, my reward was only uh, 200 gold coins, so I'm going to run out pretty quick in eternity. Uh, but boy, that guy got rewarded better, and he's got 70 million thousand of them. So he's going to get to eat at the banquet table for a long time, but I'm going to be deprived. See, that whole line of thinking is not biblical. It's earthly-minded. Um and it is a source of pride for people because they say, well, I'm going to get a better reward than you because I went out and built these churches and I went out and did this and this and this. Folks, the reward is Jesus Christ and all those who are one in him. Um, if it's not done for the glory of God, it was in vain. If it's done for foolish, selfish pride just to look better than other people, it's in vain. It meant nothing. Absolutely nothing. Turn with me, finally, over to Revelation 22. And verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's free. Okay? Jesus is our reward. So, the sin unto the death is unbelief. Because you can't have a sin in the life of a believer that would separate us from God or cause us to be ang him to be angry with us um, or punish us. He already was punished for our sins. Is he going to turn around after him being punished for it to punish us? We are either reconciled to God once and for all or we are not. Um, there is no way to reconcile the teaching the way it is, the sin unto death where where God is angry and he takes you off the earth early and he deals with you in heaven. I mean, if that was the case, we would have had God dealing with King David. There would be some example in scripture. Um, some of you might try to point to Ananias and Sapphira. They're in Acts chapter 5, I believe. Let me look. Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, Satan doesn't fill the heart of the believer. He fills the heart of the unbeliever, just like he did with Judas. Satan entered into Judas, and he went out and did uh, that which he was foreordained to do that God knew he was going to do, that he was going to betray him. And there's also not one scripture here that says that these two believed on Jesus Christ. There is, though, with Simon the sorcerer, uh, that he believed. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God." And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And then, of course, we read about the 
uh, wife that came in lied as well and died as well. So uh, there is no scripture there that says they were unbeliever, that they were believers. Uh, so that would not really be a uh, clear, concise scripture to use to defend uh, the sin unto death. So the sin unto death, I do not believe, can be committed by the believer because they have been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And they are not at enmity with God any longer, but we are one in Christ. There is no sin held against us. God has forgotten them. As far as the east is from the west. So that's going to do it for today's video. Until next time, God bless. Take care.